You are now rocking with the best, the one and only DJ Roger Riddle. I always stay fresh. No need to guess. Representing Unbox Akron and the Devil Strip crew. This is how we do. Get your hands in the air and make some noise, Pichacucha. Devil Strip, where you at? I'm going to take you on a little trip. Here we go. Come on. From the east to the west, I'm going to bring it to your chest. Detroit, the making, the Akron. You know what's happening. Had to, had to make them power moves, had to do my thing, find my own groove. Met people all along the way who back what I do. 17 years in making, and now I'm in Akron at the Bit Factory to do this for you. Yeah, I'm doing this for you, y'all. Yeah, turn it up right here. This is the truth right here. I got a bad habit. I love records. I got an itch and I can't scratch it. Got that monkey on my back, y'all. The music makes me high, no doubt about that, y'all. Hands up, ever since I was a young buck. Hip hop, soul, rock and roll. Make a spin, say what? My first record was Devo. Freedom of choice, whip it. Diana Ross was a fave. Chuck Mangione feels so good when it played. Prince was my first concert. Still a young buck, love cookies. For dessert, and I still do. Run DMC, it's like that, Akron. I put it down for y'all, yeah, I put it down. But I had to grow up, still in the music. Love computers and science. Yeah, it's like that, duh. Listening to 80s rap programming computers for fun. Yeah, I got it like that. Roger Riddle, technology and music. Make it clap, bring it back. Make it ill for the track. Number one, that's the fact. Yeah, found a hustle in making, making databases for a cigarette company. Yeah, pushing that vice. Made the cheddar, but I wasn't digging that life. Couldn't sleep at night, yo. You call this a life? Man, this ain't right. I gotta find something new, man. I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. If I had all the money I needed, I'd play my records. I quit my job and became a DJ and a bartender. It's like that right there. Yeah, this is real right here. It feel good right here. Slinging drinks, making people dance, being me, getting the word out. You heard about the coolest cat? Yeah, no doubt. Can't just hype me, put my friends on too. Roll the streets, hit the scene, mob deep with former crew. Yeah, bringing something new, and we coming for you. Taking over this city, move aside, coming through. You don't stop the body rock from the bottom to the top. Make them want what we got, yeah, it's like that. Now they want us on the news, cause we, we making them power moves. Well connected, yeah, we know everybody. I just want to say the word karate. Yeah. I, I may never own a Maserati, but I'm having fun. Y'all having fun? Pecha Kucha made some noise. Yeah. Yo, it's like that. My man rocked the fro like what's happening. Killer Chris Horn, he, we was doing it back then on TV and radio. Watch for us, taking over your favorite show. Folks had to have us. Make them pay attention, we the coolest around. Keep the people informed about the Mac Town sound. Yeah, that's how we do. Yeah, we bring it to you, we bring it to you. And we was all in the paper too. Chris loved the print and Chris loved the write and I loved the spotlight. Hey, look at us. And then point to anybody who was doing something fun. Cause it ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. That's what I'm saying. When I'm on the mic, there don't be no delaying. Keep my name in the print, LA Times, Southern Living, legit. And it didn't just, and if you didn't write about us, give me that pen. Let me show you where to begin. I spent five years writing for the Daily, making Telegraph. You don't know what I have. Get my star right there so I can do this up here. Yeah, I want to do this up here. Chris loved the paper so much, he made his own. Devil Strip, what up? Akron represent, we tell the stories the other folks don't mess with. Editors and writers, where y'all at out there? Make some noise. Yeah, wild out, make some noise. Yeah, we do it like that, man, we do it like that. It wasn't always easy, but we hustle hard. Folks wanna diss us, yo, we pulled a card. Folks wanna hate, yo, we made them wait. This ain't for everybody. It takes a special kind of person, and that's for certain. If we don't do it, who will get ill? Put the city on our backs. There ain't no turning back. Yeah, it ain't no turning back. Chalk it up to experience. Be sure that you feeling legit. Be, be big up, big up. Had to do it all to get right here. Show feel nice right here. 
It wasn't a roll of the dice right here. A lot of hard work was in this piece to get right here. Luckily, we had fun with it. Gave us what we needed to run with it. And then Chris gave me the call and told me, come ball with y'all. Get off the wall for y'all. He said, Akron knows what's happening. Do your thing up here where we can make something happen. Make the folks start clapping. And that's what I needed to hear. I packed up that truck and put that thing in gear. Yo, now I'm, now I'm in Highland Square. Somebody say, yeah. Yo, now I'm doing Unbox Akron. Celebrate, explore, tell them what's happening, no doubt. Akron's a unique city. I take pity on the fools that don't know to have that we got plenty. Introduce you to cool stuff you never seen before. Art, music, and more in a box and it's coming to your door. Get out your house and meet new people. Akron, I love what you do. My favorite DJ experience was right here with you, porch rocker, silent disco. Better than cookies from Nabisco. Seeing all the folks dancing under the night sky was quite fly. Yeah, I made it. I made the right move, fell into the right groove, dropped my needle on the record of life. That's tight, dude. So, you want to see what I do? Shameless plug, y'all. Come see me tomorrow night at Mighty Soul Night with the Mighty Soul Night crew. I'm digging deep in my soul crates. Made the dance floor sound great. Don't even hesitate. Uncorked wine bar. The show starts at 8. Yeah, the show starts at 8. Don't be late. Thank you for listening to the music of my mind. to be part of Pacha Kacha, and yeah, I totally said it another way. Um, so as you can see from Roger's presentation, this is really dynamic. And everybody who is doing um, a, pr a presentation at Pacha Kacha, wherever they are in the world, they're um, doing a presentation where they do 20 slides that only stay up for 20 seconds. So it's a very dynamic experience, and we're so excited to be um, pulling from our talent here in Akron. Um, like I said, my name is Britt, and I run um, a local arts organization called Crafty Mart. And um, <laughs> we run handmade markets locally, and our biggest event of the year is coming up, so you should come out Thanksgiving weekend. We're going to be taking over um, Summit Art Space, the Akron Art Museum, and Musica. So you guys should all come out, support the local art scene, as well as um, purchase all your Christmas gifts. Um, and uh, we're also really excited to, to kind of expand some of our programming this year to help the vendors that, that we work with um, not only thrive as artists but also as business people because as all creative entrepreneurs know that's half the battle. Um, anyway, I am so excited to introduce um, our next speaker. You might know her from one of the many, many hats that she wears around town, whether it's from Dance Dance Party Party, the all-women's dance group that she helps run over in Highland Square, the Akron Empire blog that she co-authors, her regular contributions to the Devil Strip about local history, or from her professional reputation as a book author, we can all agree that she is one of the Rubber City's most, most dynamic characters. She specializes in writing out about, of all things, Christmas TV entertainment, um, and she just released her fifth book, The Story of Archie the Talking Snowman. So let's welcome Joanna Wilson. And now something completely different. <laughs> My name is Joanna Wilson, and I'm the author of the new local history nostalgia book, The Story of Archie the Talking Snowman and Akron's History of Christmas Attractions. Tonight, I'm going to talk about my experiences in writing this book. If you grew up in the Akron area, then you may have visited Archie the Talking Snowman, the 20-foot tall interactive Christmas attraction that stood in the center of Chapel Hill Mall each Christmas for decades. Hands up, who knows Archie? Good. This is my kind of crowd. I grew up in Coggle Falls, and I visited Archie many times in the 1970s with my big sister. <laughs> this isn't me in the photo, but it could have been. I was scared of Santa and terrified of Archie's disembodied voice and his glowing red eyes. Although I was shy, Archie left a lasting impression on me. 
Over the decades, I followed along with Archie, including his retirement after 36 years at the mall and his comeback in 2012. I wrote about Archie for my blog, Akron Empire, that Britt just mentioned, and I included him in the book, A is for Akron, which I co-authored. Where's Karen? Yeah. yeah, there she is! In writing about Archie for my blog and for A is for Akron, I met Tommy Uplinger, the man who led the movement in 2011 to bring Archie back, and he approached me about writing a book about Archie. I, knew, uh, I know a good story when I hear one. And who doesn't want to work with these two crazy guys? This is Tommy and Raul Umania at my book release party in 2014. I conducted hours and hours of interviews with people involved with Archie at Chapel Hill Mall, Archie's rebuild at Lock 3, and others. Reasonably, um, no one expected to be asked about their work that they did 20, 30, and even 40 years before my questioning. Memories were often absent or unreliable. Other things written about Archie were contradictory. Chapel Hill Mall had no archives. I turned up at the Special Collections Division at Main Library to do my local history research. Turns out none of the newspapers I needed are online even, so I turned to good old-fashioned hard work and research. The best resources I discovered ended up being advertisements in old newspapers. These ads are filled with text and descriptions. The information was reliable because uh, the retailers paid good money to describe what was happening at the stores in order to bring people down into their locations. The dates were accurate as well. Not only did I find ads for Archie, but I looked back further and I found ads for Christmas attractions before 1968, including Summit Mall, the area plazas, and of course the downtown department stores, including Jaeger's, O'Neill's, and Polsky's. There was a context and a history of Christmas attractions before Archie. This was utterly fascinating to me. I spent more than four months in front of microfilm machines at Main Library, reading old Beacon journals and Akron Times Press newspapers. I discovered 100 relevant years of Christmas attractions and came to understand the competitive environment between local retailers who created Christmas attractions to compete for shoppers' attention. I learned that the rubber capital of the world and her economy supported retailers that created Christmas attractions that rivaled cities much larger than ours, including Chicago, St. Louis, Baltimore, and Denver. Notes from this long, rich history spanned a whole wall in my office. Each one of those green sheets of paper is an eight and a half by 11 hanging on my wall. This history included breathtaking Christmas window displays with new animatronics most every year for decades. There were both secular and sacred displays. Popular themes included storybook characters, the night before Christmas poem, circus performers, puppet shows, woodland creatures, and Santa and his elves in various scenes. Becoming more competitors, retailers downtown also created lures to bring people off the streets and up into the stores with walkthrough displays. My favorite one is from 1934 at O'Neill's. It was a Zeppelin uh, walkthrough experience journey to the North Pole. There were various windows that you could look through and you walk through the metal structure to see this North Pole journey. Of course, at the end, you would be deposited in front of Santa. <laughs> Although the local department stores have been closed since the 80s, the history and memories are not forgotten. A life-sized white nativity display that first went on, went on display atop O'Neill's marquee in 1955 is still exhibited each year by a church in South Akron. I was lucky enough to meet and interview Larry and Cynthia Nixon, who also value this history of Christmas attractions. They have worked for almost 30 years with the animatronic, with the mechanical display collection originally owned by Niels that they've put out for nearly 30 years here in the city. I also met Jeannie Jordan, a display designer for the past three years at Lock 3, who has taken over the care and restoration of the former O'Neill's mechanical figures. She was inspired by her childhood memories of O'Neill's and Polsky's windows, started her career in Atlanta, and now has come back to Akron. And here's her at uh, 500 plates. Turns out Archie's story is Akron's story. It's people and our ever-changing consumer habits. It's also an inspiring story of a group of people who are tired of all the changes that come to Rust Belt cities like ours. They work to bring back a meaningful tradition from their childhoods for the sake of their children and the next generation. I suggested to my editor that he create a book cutter cover to reflect the values of Archie and Akron's story. Rather than use a photo that locks Archie into a particular time era, 
I wanted Archie's appearance to reflect his informal, personal, one-of-a-kind, geeky, nerdy, handmade but not mass-produced image as a friend to all children, thus a crocheted doll. If you doubt the power of a promotional character like Archie, let me remind you of Rudolph, a character developed for free giveaway storybooks for Montgomery Wards in the late 1930s. Now we can't imagine Christmas without Rudolph, and many people feel that same way about Archie. For the record, Archie is Akron's longest lasting Christmas attraction. <laughs> After research and, and writing this book, I'm extremely proud and excited to finally share everything I found out about him and us. Ultimately, an Akron story, even if it is a weird one. Long live Archie. And just a quick plug, if you are free on Saturday, December 12th, Joanna's going to be leaving, leading an Akron to Akron tour where she's going to talk about the history of the holiday season as it relates to downtown Akron. So you'll, you won't want to miss that. You can find that on Summit Live 365. <laughs> I have, yeah, tied it all in there. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming Dominic Falcione. Did I do this correctly? Thank you. Um, Dominic has a bio that would take me longer than we have the rest of the evening to share. He is an incredibly talented designer and artist, um, extremely versatile. He is currently um, focusing on, I'm trying to skip all of this, you've done so much. <laughs> You, I, it's amazing. Um, Dominic works extensively with John Communal of Communal Sculpture Concepts in Akron. He's exposed to making multiple functional pieces of work for clientele. And he has also worked independently through the studio Rubber City Fab, working with homeowners, business owners, and interior designers. Dominic will present a brief timeline of works um, while discussing the influences of his design within the Akron landscape and where he hopes his work might lead. Hello, everybody. Okay. I'm really glad that I can just read from these papers. This helps me out immensely. So instead of doing a slideshow specifically about the work I do, I kind of lumped everything together and categorized the work in the stages of progression that are based on my own personal pursuits as far as what I try to achieve with every project that I do. This slideshow is one of my early student projects. I had a wireless microphone attached to the biggest balloon I could find and tethered it to a boulder with a pair of headphones and the project idea was based on connecting something that was visible but not out of reach. When I was a student at the art school, there, <clears throat> the main push was to teach concept-oriented or narrative work. I was in the practice of deconstructing logic and transforming it into abstract ideas that could be communicated through, oh man. <laughs> Early on, I made this clay head of myself and, and I used it uh, periodically throughout my years in college. This, this was a project I did using my putty head. One room was filled with castings that were placed in these rubberized boxes with other scattered like autumn leaves on the floor, the room had a hidden microphone, and the sound of the room, oof, man. I was really attracted to the forms I could make with the putty head. It may be a little more a common sight these days, but with the light kind of placement and lighting, the negative shape inside of the shell would appear to be reversed and would make this ghostly illusion of the head inside that would stay in perspective as you moved around it. So there are these faces that would appear to be turned towards you as you walked around it. And here's a, just another example of that, and I'm gonna skip this. And really what I liked most about this is that it had that illusion quality, and it's pretty much down to the basic, just a single element in a space, and the space is what really makes that work. And it was those kind of things that I really liked, things that I couldn't necessarily make with my hands. This is one of my first metal smithing projects that I did. Um, so I started getting really interested in object making. Um, I really like being able to make elements and put them together to compose a narrative as an object rather than an image. So I switched over to metal smithing because it was like small sculpture and required a high level of detail and precision. I kept making work like that. It had some kind of personal narrative. I started exploring all kinds of materials. And in this particular case, the magnets, I started getting uh, 
infatuated with Magnus because, again, it was something that I couldn't necessarily make with my own hands. It had its, a force of its own. Um, this is uh, another piece that I did using uh, fur and copper, and it's just a, a composition of elements um, to express some kind of narrative, some kind of story. This one's about Robert Falcon Scott. He was a polar expeditionist, so all the materials kind of relate to that. This is a bronze casting. It seems like my slides are going so much faster. This is a bronze casting that uh, it's just a single piece, but it, 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 was, it was a way to bear things down to a single item, but still make different components that interacted together. And what I liked about this was that the, the metal itself was beautiful in a way that something that I couldn't necessarily make. This is a spoon that I carved out of aluminum. It's a tongue spoon. I've used it a couple times. It's food safe for ice cream. It was really great. And <clears throat> um, I kind of think that I'm a little behind. So. so I started to get more interested in things that people could actually use. I wanted to use things outside of the scope of the gallery or show space. I wanted to start making work with a narrative. It wasn't personal reflection about myself or my values. And so this was like the first thing that I made that was inside and out. I was made to sell it to be as, as high quality as I could. And this is another where I started composing. It wasn't any kind of narrative. It was just a composition of elements. This is one of the first pieces of furniture that I made for a client. And <clears throat> it's... Uh, it's called, I called it a verb table, and I liked it because uh, it had like a presence by... It, man, I seems really fast. <laughs> These are, this is another uh, ceramic slip castings that I was doing, and one of the main things that I liked about this was that it was a way to kind of give it life. These things were just, they would just lay on the floor, and man, I'm sorry, but is that really that? This seems extremely fast. Is that? That seems really fast, I'm sorry. That, that's got to be too fast. Okay, I'm just going to wing it. So, <clears throat> so uh, working in Akron U, I made these tables. It's one of the first things that I made and completely out in CAD. And this was another way to uh, like do something that had some kind of narrative to it, but it was, the narrative was more like how you go about using it. And the whole thing was like concealed to where there was no, man, that's okay. I have no idea who this guy is, but I love this picture. Um, these are things that I did for Angel Falls this year. Um, there were tree surrounds, and again, I think um, I'm a little messed up here because I don't think you guys have uh, quite the, the scope of the point of all this. I think it kind of, uh, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, mm, well, I think the... I th I think the main idea of this kind of got lost through the speed of this. These are bike racks that I designed for Kent, and two of them are, they're all gone now. So, <laughs> Akron Art Museum, uh, Lightbright, not being, you know, doing something that had some kind of like tangible um, element to it that people really liked, and <laughs> I don't really know what to say. How about if I just show you the slideshow and we can, like, I don't know, just look at the work. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And here we are. This is what space looked like. Uh, these, this is James, Austin, and Jack, and these are the guys that you know, kind of started, that pulled me into this and got me started working with this. They're part founders, and this last slide is just to say that, you know, to thank these guys, they're doing what they're doing for the arts and culture here, because I think that they help to make a space that, you know, everybody can use and is, uh, has, wow, and has a lot of potential for other things.
Well, now that we've uncovered one of the many, many challenges of this format, and we're still having a good time, um, we'll, um, we'll go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Um, she is an artist who works in a variety of media, with a variety of collaborators, and in a variety of different places. She'll be speaking about some collaborative works and artistic interests that have taken her all over the world, to Israel, Poland, Spain, and more. These interactions with incredible creative people have enriched her life and her work. So please welcome Priscilla Roggenkamp. Oh, thank you. Well, I wanted to talk about collaboration because this seemed like the place to do it. And this is certainly a collaborative place and everybody's involved in collaboration here. So anyways, uh, collaboration starts with all kinds of things. And one of the things I said is if you're digging, my, my words weren't up here. There was some, some text up there. Anyways, if you're digging a hole, you definitely might need some collaborators. And that's one of the things that I've, that's happened to me over time is that I was able to dig some holes with some friends along the way. Um, Collaboration is something that's really important to me because I think about every art piece is something that I learn from and I definitely learn from the collaborate, collaborators I've worked with. One of my um, most often collaborators is here tonight with me, Keith McMahon. He's in the black t-shirt there. And our first collaboration was about 10 years ago. We were asked to go to Akko, Israel and to do, be part of an exchange there. Uh, we immediately hit the ground and had to find stone and carve some stone. We had a week to create this piece. Uh, so here we are with a collaborator, Yuri, who's finding stone for us on the side of the road, and we're trying to carve it in the, the hot Israel sun. Um, part of that piece was uh, 60 yards of fabric that I asked 100 children to draw their pictures of their portraits and their hopes and dreams. I printed them on the fabric. They became my collaborators, and I took their hopes and dreams with me to Israel, and I, I wrapped them up in this piece. Um, so you can probably see the little figures uh, that I printed on the fabric along the way. The collaboration also came back to the United States, and so, um, so, so we recreated this piece, carving new stones in the Canton Museum of Art. And in the bottom, you can see some of the people that hung out with us in Israel and a little bit of a sense of the light and the space and the time there. Um, after that, we set off, both Keith and I, to um, Central Wyoming College to create another very quick compressed collaboration piece. We had 10 days, we had found objects only to use, and um, so, so we had to put together something significant with that kind of limitations, and that was a lot of fun. So here we are working in a new space, trying new materials. For me, much of this is new, uh, and this is the piece that we came up with, uh, and it's still at Central Wyoming um, today. Um, so the collaboration has taken us all over and also created a lot of new challenges for us to, to uh, in, be involved in. Um, and I think that's what people are seeing here as well. Um, I can't remember which slide is that. Okay, so the next show that we were involved in was a really big space that we were invited to show in and we decided rather than taking our work, we would make new work because we like scale and this was part of scale. So here we are in our studio working on this piece, um, which is uh, actually six panels larger than, than what we've done before and so we're creating that scale. Um, here we are hanging the piece and uh, those fabric pieces in the back are also mine. These are the pieces that are finished and they're going to be hung in this beautiful space. Um, we met during this hanging our, our, a new collaborator, a new friend, Keith Mc, um, Ken Arthur, who became a future collaborator with us. Uh, as I headed toward my sabbatical, I teach at Ashland University, um, I wanted to create a show that also involved multiple people. This piece was involved with a dozen of my friends who do knitting and crocheting, and I said, let's pick a palette and make a piece. And so they became not only involved in the, the physical act of making it, but I wanted them to be involved in decision making as well. Um, this is another piece that I created with my mother, Carol Swope, who's also here. She taught me to sew, and fiber has been a, a really big part in my life. I like the mechanical aspects of things like zippers, so we, um, we found a thousand zippers and created this piece. Um, they're almost all recycled zippers, and that was real important to me in my work. Um, the show we put together was called The Threads That Bind, and so these are some of the pieces that I made. They are bucket forms that are roughly fr uh, um, figural, but also talk about the things that we take with us on our journey through life. Um, 
thought there was another slide in before that. Oh, here we go. And so this is one of the iterations of the show. I invited other people to um, think about the, t the title, Threads That Bind, and what they would do with it. One of my favorite pieces in the, is in the front, a young woman from Kansas who made a, a braided rug dress and uh, talked about some of the social issues that were involved in that. And you can see some of my other um, pieces in the background. Um, one opportunity I had that was a great collaboration was to go to Haystack uh, in Maine. Some of you might have heard of this place. I was an artist in residence this summer, and along the way I wanted to do something I hadn't done for a while, and that was print, so I made some collagraph prints, and uh, you can see the one on, on the right there, and, and the printing process was also something that was very collaborative because it wasn't something I'd done before. Lastly, um, I want to show you a piece that we did um, at Galleon Community Hos Hospital in Galleon, Ohio. Uh, the three of us were asked to create this piece. Um, it's called Body, Mind, and Soul. We each created a stone and a metal piece that would go on top of it. Um, I had been making uh, ceramic torsos for about a year and blowing every one of them up in the kiln. So I took them to, up to a, uh, a woman, Michelle Gorse, who actually cast one of them for me, and it's a beautiful metal piece. Um, let's see. What's next here? Here we go. So the day, this is tragic, but the day before we were to install this very big piece with stones that weighed over a thousand pounds, the man who, was, who had the equipment to do it had a heart attack. And so at the very last minute, we again had to call on friends, collaborators, people with, in, in the know, Al is there, uh, jury rigging scaffolding to do something it's not really supposed to do. And it lifted up and moved these stones into place. Um, it was a really big deal. Here's Ken creating his spirit. He was spirit. Um, Keith was mine and I was body, uh, and so he's in his workshop creating that. Um, and talk about a cool workshop if you ever, ever get a chance to see this guy. This is two of the pieces done. This is mind and spirit done, and this is Keith McMahon, again, who's here tonight, who did uh, the mind sculpture. Um, this was a great opportunity for us to, to kind of pull together lots of ideas um, and, and see, see one full piece that, that represented all those ideas together. Um, one of those serendipity moments, and here, here I am, one of the things I wanted to say was the digging is worthwhile. So those shows infant survival rates. Ohio is dead last among 50 states in black infant mortality. No, wait, I'm sorry, this shows household wealth. No, it shows the quality of schools. You're probably on to me by now, right? This chart doesn't have has no numbers because the numbers don't matter. We need a narrative. As human beings, in order to understand that information, we need a story. And we only have two narratives available to us, and they're old and tired narratives. So we, I think that shows a failure of imagination. Uh, the first narrative says, the cause of inequality is malice or racism. And the paradigmatic symbol of that racism is Bull Connor directing fire hoses and dogs to do violence to peacefully demonstrating black people. Uh, the problem is that many white people don't see themselves as Bull Connor, and they feel this kind of racism has long since passed, and they're mostly right. The other narrative we use to explain persistent inequality is merit. This narrative says that fair competition or meritocracy results in racial inequality, and the problem with that is that many talented, smart black people are working hard, competing hard, and still not getting the rewards. They're right, too. Each of these narratives serves as a, both as a self-serving rationalization and an accusation. Well, it can't be that our only choices are white people being racist or black people being inferior. So to change the discussion, we need better narratives. We need to be more creative about how we think about race. Maybe we can look to business. How do we get a particular product that dominates a market without superior merit? I'm going to talk about telephones. The odd thing about telephones is that one telephone is not worth much because you can't talk to anybody. A telephone is a network good. Its value actually grows the more copies there are because each additional telephone lets you talk to more people. S to be valuable, every telephone has to comply with the network standard. They have to be able to connect to the other phones, right? So if you were to invent the perfect personal communication device tomorrow, maybe there's an amazing glorified walkie-talkie out there, it would be worth nothing unless you can convince everybody else to get the same device, right? So the telephone dominates not because it's the best device, it's because it's the established standard, right? And notice, you don't have to hate walkie-talkies in order to prefer telephones, right? Well, maybe whiteness is like a market standard. To the extent that there's any communication barrier between races, right, then maybe black people just don't connect to the network very well because they don't uh, comply with the standard. And talking louder, by the way, doesn't help. <laughs> so 
Here's another example. I know all the cool kids are using Macs, but does anyone know what share of the desktop and laptop computers run Windows? 85%. Is that because Windows is the best operating system around? No. Windows is buggy. It crashes all the time. All the best viruses are designed for Windows, right? So how does Windows succeed? It succeeds because it's the standard, right? Anybody writing software writes it to run on Windows. It means that sort of anyone who learns Windows can change jobs and still know how to, how to work the computer. Any company buying computers right, should buy Windows because that's what most people know how to use. Maybe whiteness is like Windows and it dominates because whiteness is the standard. Anyone who wants to sell anything to most people will design it for white people. Right. How else do you persistently dominate a market without merit or malice? Coke still controls over 40% of the market for soft drinks. Is that because Coke discovered the magic formula that is objectively the best, most meritorious beverage ever created? I don't think so, right? It's because it's the real thing. It makes you want to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, right? <laughs> that's, that's what brands do, right? You see the logo, you feel good. Maybe whiteness is like a brand. You see it, you think of wholesomeness and competence and America, right? But brands are, are managed strategically. There's no Bill Gates of whiteness who's uh, managing how whiteness is portrayed. So now I'm trying to imagine how can you have dominance without conscious intent, and I'm going to talk about ants. <laughs> ants can find the shortest, straightest path from the nest to the food without any individual ant being very smart. All they have to do is follow They leave a trace of pheromones behind them, and they follow the strongest pheromone trail. That's it. Pheromones decay over time. The shortest path is the most attractive. No one's in charge. No one directs them. There's no ant conspiracy making it happen. But you'll notice that if you don't recognize the scent, that system doesn't help you, right? There doesn't have to be a magical, um, a malicious conspiracy. That efficient system, it's, if, if you can't follow the scent, that system is invisible to you, right? And that ant just looks confused, the one that doesn't follow the scent. And we say, well, why can't you just follow the path like everyone else, right? Fish! Now fish. Remember that swarm of fish, right, that mocked Nemo, right? How did they do that? Collective, intentional conspiracy? No, it's another case of swarm intelligence. Individual fish are not any smarter than ants, right? But it turns out that can fish really do amazing tightly packed shapes in the water, and it's not because there's a fish control tower directing them all. Computer scientists are trying to model how this happens, and they figured out that if you just follow a few simple rules, stay close to the other fish, keep an equal distance between you and the other fish around you, right? Um, you get this really complicated behavior, and the point is that it's the simple rules, not any conscious intent or mastermind that's coordinating this effort. You don't have to have superior merit. You don't have to have a malicious conspiracy in order to produce patterns of domination. There are a lot of narratives, a lot of stories available to us, and maybe if you just conform to the network standard, maybe if you have a strong brand image, you're following simple rules like hiring people that you get along with or that you're comfortable with, Maybe that's what produces those complex patterns, right? Well, so what? What does it matter? Persistent racial inequality is still an accusation because black infant mortality in Ohio really is the highest of any state in the country. And now I've suggested that maybe it's neither because of racism or black behavior. I'm letting you all off the hook. What are you supposed to do about that? Well, I'm hoping that you'll act, right? Not because your evil racism makes you directly responsible, not because your bad choices caused it to happen. Take credit and blame and guilt and defensiveness out of it. You should act because babies are beautiful and their lives are worth saving, and it just takes a little imagination.
If everyone could find their seats, we're about to get started again. All right, everyone, are you shifting in? I saw the bar still had a substantial line. Weird. People in Akron like beer? <laughs> How are we doing? Do you want me to start? Hello everyone, I've been instructed to just talk to them. <laughs> Welcome to the Bit Factory. How many of you guys have been here before? Really, that's a lot. How many of you are going to take advantage of this space and come back and bring events here again? <laughs> yep. Be so generous with this incredible space and the view alone is pretty incredible. So, thank you. Um, have I said enough words? May I start? Okay. Uh, thank you guys. This has been such an incredible evening and I have to say that I, it is entirely because of those of you who came out tonight. So the fact that we have this many people in Akron who love to learn interesting things is pretty remarkable. So thank you for being here. And now, for real, um, I would like to introduce Dr. Bish Jain. Dr. Jane is a forensic psychiatrist and currently assistant professor of psychiatry. His title alone will exhaust you. Program director of forensic psychology fellowship and medical director of forensic psychiatry services at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is, right? He is a homegrown from Northeast Ohio and graduated from Stowe High School. How many Stowe graduates do we have in here tonight? There we go, you're in, you're in good company. Uh, Kent State University yeah! and Northeast Ohio Medical University. So put your hands together and welcome Dr. Jane. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk about guns and mental illness. But first, but first, um, shout it out. What is this painting? This is the creation of Adam on the uh, ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, of course, painted 500 years ago by Michelangelo. And one interpretation of the Sistine Chapel of the creation of Adam is that Michelangelo had actually painted a picture of the brain behind his depiction of God. And one interpretation is that God is actually down to Adam the divine power, which is intellect and the mind. And this is one of the things I think about when I'm practicing psychiatry, when I'm trying to understand mental illness, and when we're involved with trying to uh, treat patients. However, as many of you know, over the years, psychiatry and mental illness has been portrayed a certain way in the media. We see almost anonymously that violence and mental illness are used interchangeably. However, we know that in our field that this is just not true. And this is also overinflated and overrepresented in the media, in the news media, when we see national horrific tragedies. After all of these events, it's not too soon after that we hear people talking about mental illness and violence and almost using this synonymously. And of course, we know that this then comes up into the political debate, where people, it's easy, and it's an easy slogan or a soundbite to say, it's not guns that are the problem, it's crazy people that are the problem. And of course, this is something that has been overinflated in the media and has been discussed quite a bit over the years. But we also know that we have to be cautious when we hear about anything with a political agenda. This is Mayor Marion Barry, the late Mayor, uh, Mayor Marion Barry, and this illustrates one of his quotes illustrates 
uh, one of the examples of distorting information, he said that outside of the killings, DC has one of the lowest crime rates in the country. <laughs> so we have to be cautious of stats, uh, damn stats, uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics, of course. And to emphasize the importance of how much social media and how much media in general influences us, I guarantee you, 40 years after this movie, many of you still have this music playing in your mind when you go out to the beach. <laughs> and this also had a significant effect in 1975 when Jaws came out that a lot of people stopped going to beach resorts and we saw a, a precipitous drop in people going right after the movie because they were scared of sharks on all the beaches and all the oceans. And we see a similarity with mental illness. We see that although there may be some association between severe mental illness, like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, most individuals who have a severe mental illness are not violent. And in fact, most individuals who have a severe mental illness are more likely to, to be victims of violence and actually perpetrators of violence. And this is something very important to keep in mind when we're hearing these debates. Uh, in the media and nationally. And one potential uh, downfall of this is that when people blame uh, those with a history of mental illness, they might be scapegoating the problem and actually missing some of the major issues that are actually occurring. Things like unemployment, things like drug and alcohol use, uh, things like other criminal activity. And uh, there's one quote here uh, that's gonna come up. Uh, that's uh, hurt people hurt people. So we also have to remember that victimization can also perpetuate that cycle of violence. And so we have to keep some of these things in mind when these things are actually discussed. And also keep in mind that most individuals with mental illness are not uh, really the, the sole cause of violence. 90 to 95% of violence actually does not stem from mental illness. And this is true for homicide. But one thing that is not actually brought up uh, a lot and is a very important figure to keep in mind, of all firearm-related deaths, two-thirds are actually suicide and not homicide. And although there may be an association between mental illness and violence, uh, a modest association, we know there's a very strong association between suicide and mental illness. So if we are talking about guns and the mentally ill, we should also be focusing on individual protection and personal protection. Um, but some of the uh, folks may say, so what? Uh, if people are going to kill themselves, they'll find a way anyways. However, that's just not true. Uh, what we've seen, for example, the Golden Gate Bridge, the number one site for suicide in the United States, uh, they followed 500 people who were just about to jump from the Golden Gate Bridge, and they restrained them. They followed them for, on average, 26 years and found that more than 90% of them actually continued to live. Um, and did not complete suicide. So there is a potential benefit to actually removing lethal methods for suicide um, and to prevent suicide. But we know the Second Amendment isn't going anywhere. And that's something we have to radically accept. And when you ask people, what are the reasons you have guns, a lot of people will say for personal protection. Based on the surveys, about 60% of people say personal protection. And recently, my wife and I drove through western uh, Pennsylvania, and some of you may have heard Pennsylvania is basically Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in the middle. <laughs> and when we were out in the middle of nowhere, I had that uh, thought in my mind, you know, maybe I should have a gun for personal protection. By the way, there was also a sign that said Indian Trading Post. I was relieved to understand that this is not a place where they trade Indian people. And of course, like the political debates and this issue of guns, we have to keep in mind that there might be different vantage points of truth. And both sides might be correct. But like the book Getting to Yes, the solution to a lot of these national debates, as well as when I work with patients individually about their gun ownership, it's very important to collaborate. And a venue like this, a setting like this, with all these different minds, all these different backgrounds coming together is very important. So finally, one of the most rewarding things for me, as I understand art and science, is to break through the surface to actually try to understand, take in true facts, have a deeper understanding, and then at the core of it, we might actually be proven that our assumptions were incorrect. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Dr. Jane. Um, we are now um, excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, he uh, holds dual citizenship in both Youngstown, where he's from, and Akron, where he's lived <laughs> since 2008. He is the Design, Marketing, and Communications Coordinator for the Akron Art Museum, but of course, like all creatives, he has a few side hustles. At night, he runs a small publishing company called 1701 Press, and occasionally he writes things of his own, one of which he published in the Belt Magazine anthology, Car Bombs to Cookie Tables, all about Youngstown. I'm happy to introduce Dominic Caruso. Is this, uh, is this loud enough? I think I'm losing my voice a little bit. Is this good? Yeah. Good. Okay. The Akron Art Museum. Um, I work there. I love it there. It's a beautiful building filled with world-class art. But I think sometimes a, a fancy building filled with art can be kind of intimidating, and it was for me, even though I like art. I went to art school, uh, but in 10 years I had visited only maybe three times. But in the last few years, something happened that made me want to be a part of it. What changed? I was watching a, a video recently and a researcher who worked with children asked them, where do ideas come from? And one kid said, somebody says something and it goes out into the air and it bounces around and then it goes into your head and you have it and you can do anything you want with it. Somebody says something and it goes out into the air and it bounces around and then it goes into your head and you can do anything you want with it. That was my experience of Slide Jam in 2014, which is an event kind of like this one. Ideas are like a conversation. Ideas are for everyone. And if art is driven by ideas, then art is for everyone, too. Sometimes the conversation is between the artists in the gallery space, like Trenton Doyle Hancock's exhibition, Skin and Bones, where he was painting directly on the walls, along with the installation of 20 years of his Hieronymus Bosch meets Spider-Man style of drawing. And sometimes it's a conversation between the artists and the materials, like Tony Fair, who was also behind the buoy that was in the second slide. This temporary artwork, uh, Fair created by putting thousands of pieces of blue painter's tape on the window. Something ordinary can be transformed into something extraordinary. One of the exciting things about the art museum is is that the staff recognizes the value of having the artist in the gallery designing the space in which their work is displayed. And this is an example of uh, Paul Henry Ramirez's uh, installation of his paintings uh, during Beauty Reigns last year. And this, uh, this is an activity in between stories at Art Tales. And when I asked Amanda Crow, who's in the middle there, uh, one of the museum educators uh, who designed the story time, why they were all dancing on newspapers, she said um, all of the stories that they told featured artwork that was collaged, so dancing on newspaper meant, was meant to give the kids a sense of what it was like to be in a collage. And then she said she was inspired by the scene uh, in the movie Summerstock in which Gene Kelly dances on newspaper, which is a clinic in how ideas are like play, like music, and like a conversation. And this is also from Creative Playdate. This is Trick or Treat on South High Street. Um, kids can come uh, during Trick or Treat at the museum and uh, in the galleries and collect art supplies instead of candy. And of course, they can play with the giant light bright, which I'm told was made by a local guy. Uh, <laughs> oh, Dominic Falcione. <laughs> I don't even know uh, if I have anything to say about this. <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes it's, well, it's not about you know, turning kids into art, artists or turning people into artists, it's about exploration and thought process and giving people the tools to play out their ideas and live a creative life. When you look at art, it's like having a conversation between what you take in and what you make of it. Ideas even if you're not even trying to, and those ideas can be anything. It can be about understanding what it means to be human, or about new ways of living together. So this is Chuck Close and uh, Barry Underwood, and this is Elon Atsui. That's why the uh, museum's collection is so extraordinary. It's a collection of 5,000 objects, uh, 3,000 photographs. Prominent national and Ohio artists are all displayed together, their works in conversation with each other in the galleries. 
Art is for everyone. This gallery is the Corbin Gallery, which the staff uses to do experimental and interactive community-connected uh, exhibitions. And this was called Living with Art, which was a project that we did with Karen Starr, who's here. <laughs> We all live with art, and this is sort of imagining what it would be like to live with the gallery art. There's also Crafty Mart. The museum, <laughs> the museum is a community space, and Crafty Mart is part of that community conversation. So Crafty Mart is an incubator for small businesses, and it's a kickstart toward reinvigorating downtown. And the next one is November 28th and 29th. Somebody says something, it bounces around, and it goes in your head, and you can do anything you want with it. So this is Inside Out. With funding from the Knight Foundation, we were able to bring reproductions of art from the collection into neighborhoods all over Akron. We hope to inspire you, but what happened was you inspired us. Here's another example of art being created in the gallery space. This is Charles Benneke, a printmaker at UA, and he created this rather awe-inspiring plume of printed materials that come off the wall and into three-dimensional space, and then the, the little cheat uh, a uh, slide is an image of them actually installing it and doing the work. So if Inside Out brings the art outside, the Bud and Susie Rogers garden, which is under construction right now, will bring, open the museum up into downtown altogether and create a new civic commons. Uh, it's a place where you can relax, have meaningful art experiences, explore ideas on your own or with your family, and of course, we're gonna have incredible art programming there. And sometimes, the museum is in a conversation with other organizations in Northeast Ohio. Right now, right now there's an exhibition of the museum collection artwork at Transformer Station in Cleveland. So what happens when you install highlights from the collection in a different configuration in a beautiful new space? This is a montage of an upcoming installation that's going on right now for a show called Neo Geo that opens next week. And this is Natalie Laness from uh, Toledo. She creates room-sized paintings and yes, she's painting on the floor as well. You can go into the painting and experience what it's like. And sometimes, the, and the conversation is simultaneous and ongoing. In May 2016, we're gonna open a shared exhibition of Mark Mothersbaugh Myopia with Mocha Cleveland. So like two jazz musicians, the two venues, Mocha and Akron, are gonna play off one another with a shared presentation of Mothersbaugh's work. So to hear the song, you have to listen to both, you have to visit both, and the ideas that you get are yours to do anything you want with. <laughs> For anyone interested in presenting in the future, I think Dominic's onto something with that cheat slide. I saw that, two slides in one. Very well done. Um, next up, we have. Next up, we have Phyllis Steiner. Phyllis has been with Hattie Larum since 2000, working in training and development, media productions, and is now as the director of Hattie's Creative Arts. She's been a strong advocate for people with disabilities since 1984, chairing or co-chairing more than 50 events promoting the excess of people. As director, Phyllis is responsible for all aspects of Hattie's Creative Arts, from staffing to marketing to the expansion of the program. Since the program's inception in 2002, Hattie's Creative Arts has grown from six to 264 artists working in painting, photography, pottery, music, and creative writing. Let's welcome Phyllis. Hi all, how are you? It's a good, good time to be in Akron, isn't it? Ready? Okay. 13% uh, of Ohio, uh, Amer uh, people in Ohio have a uh, disability. What I wanted to talk to you about is one half of 1% of that 13%. These are people who are medically fragile. Uh, they cannot walk, they cannot talk, that kind of thing. I work at the Hattie Larlam Center. We're nationally recognized, and these are some of our artists. All of them are wheelchair bound. All of them live at the center. Most of the people we do work with receive some kind of residential service. So life is pretty repetitive for them because it needs to be, and creativity has been different until our CEO over there on the right um, said, let's come up with something.
possibility, something that we could really do to make this connection. And so we got some training, had some friends at Matheny uh, in New Jersey, and we started this whole program. What we do is we say we hire professional, all the guys you see here are all professional artists. They work one-on-one -on -one with each one of the artists. We don't have anybody uh, trained in developmental disabilities or anything. Everything is all, they're just creative, passionate, driven people. This is Angie, and one of the things that you, we say all the time is we have no preconceptions of what anyone can or cannot do when they come into the area. And Angie used to be very quiet. She would never smile. She would never anything. And look at that face. That face, a great face right there. She totally loves being in the art studio. Everything is about communicating since our folks don't, uh, as I said, they don't talk. We have to figure out what's their yes, what's their no. So it could be a raise of an eyebrow or an arm. But the biggest thing we found is that sometimes when there's no response from them, that's because we're just asking the right questions. You know, so we really work hard on that. Uh, choice and neutrality, that's a big thing for us. Um, Tim is a professional artist, but he does not ever put any of his own personal, what he likes to do with his art in there. And trust me, if you did, and it's not what the choice of the artist is, they let you know. <laughs> this is Mott and um, Jess, and uh, it's just really a nice, a good time. We really get to know them one-on-one. -on -one. And the good news about this is that all of them are now starting, we're starting to see that in some of the other areas of the programs where they were doing that. This is some of the artwork created by uh, some of our artists. You can see some real expression there. I like the one in the middle because he, was t he doesn't speak, so he's going, yes, outside, outside, and he put that on his artwork and stuff. So you can see it's all a little bit different. That's one of the ceramic pieces. This is a young man over here, down here, and I cheated too. I did multiple slides, sorry. Um, but he, uh, inter he, took, uh, he wrote a piece of music. That's his painting over there in the upper corner. And we put a video camera on that little dolly. And he filmed it going around his painting to his music. We also use technology a lot. Um, the upper corner is Raj's view of the world, which is the ceiling at all times, so we, from my video experience, this is just a field monitor, and now Raja has this, as seven other people do, in the studio, so they can see everything. He can see everything now. We have been so well accepted in the community. This is amazing. Um, we have been from everywhere, from downtown Cleveland at 200 Public Square, and we were also invited two years in a row to the Naples Invitational Art festival so we were pretty excited about that yeah that's pretty exciting news um, these are a couple of our artists who are now working in our constant companion program we expanded that a little bit so these are a little bit more higher functioning people who can maybe talk a little bit or use some of your hand their hands but you can see this is a self-portrait by bill i think that's a fabulous piece isn't that and this is Zach, who could not use his hands, but now he says, Zach rocks, every time he comes in. And that's how he starts his painting. You know, he's a, he's a really cool guy. He does painting, and he also does music. He's actually writing his own song. And he's, you know, he's really doing a, a great job with that. This little guy is John Luke, and he did this painting that was on display for two and a half years. And we took him to his display, and that was his painting, the one the man's looking at. He had not seen that piece of artwork in two years, and he was pushing his wheelchair so fast to get to it because he knew it was his. So when people say they don't know, I beg to differ. They do know what's theirs. It's all about the connection uh, with our, peop with our uh, artists. Uh, and we're also the storyteller because they don't talk. So we are very, very careful about what happens so we can tell each artist story in each piece. Um, this is James, who is, uh, him and Mott both cut their hair and gave it uh, to, uh, along with his dad, and they gave it uh, to a, what is it? Thank you. Uh, they gave it to that, and um, so this was their reaction after they both cut their hair, but they are doing a really, really, they're really close. This is our
expansion, and I have to tell you, um, we call this the inclusionist movement because we're all artists here, right? And you have to have some kind of movement. So we just moved in August to the Summit Art Space, and I have to tell you from the art community in Summit County, thank you, thank you, thank you for the generous, generous acceptance for us. You have no idea how much this means to us. These are a couple more of our artists, but you can see now what we talk about is empowerment. So we're empowering people to do things that they have never done before. Just giving them the opportunity for that is, makes all the difference in the world. And we do this with the main, main mantra of art for art's sake. So um, when we talk to people about this, why I'm happy to be here is, I know we can do this with the population we work with. Imagine if we could do that for a lot more people. I know it can be happening because it's art for art's sake. One artist, one moment, one day at a time. Thank you so very much. All right. So our next and final speaker evening is pretty much one of the biggest arts enthusiasts that I've ever met. Um, you can usually spot her in a crowd by her big smile, despite her petite stature. Um, after teaching public school art, um, she decided to strike it out on her own so that she could offer art enrichment courses to all ages. She'll teach you how to draw, weave, sculpt, or even paint an amazing portrait of, of Jeff Goldblum. Please welcome the owner of Smart Studio in Highland Square, Jennifer Davis. Good evening, room full of people. Um, my name is Jennifer Davis. I am the owner and visual arts educator at Smart Studio, where I offer art enrichment workshops for all ages. I'm going to talk about being inspired and how we can use inspiration to guide our creative journey. My creative journey um, was supported from a very early age by my parents, who encouraged exploration, self-discovery, and learning through play. They also supported and encouraged my self-expression. So fast forward, big leap forward, um, to today, my philosophy of art education, um, it's inspired by the ways in which my parents encouraged the learning. I don't really see myself as a teacher. Um, I see myself as a facilitator or a guide to encourage students in the art making process. As an educator and an artist, there's so many times that I'm asked, well, how are you inspired? What inspires you? And I think that before, before I can answer that question or you can answer that question, I do think that it's important that um, we understand what that means to be inspired and why it's important to be inspired. Yeah, yeah. this image has made its way around the internet but I think it's a beautiful representation of what it means to be inspired. To inspire means to fill with an animating, a quickening, or exalting influence. It also means to produce or arouse. So being inspired, it ignites a feeling, and then that feeling motivates you to produce or to create. Um, I also think that inspiration is this beautiful relationship between your current knowledge and then all the information that you gather and collect throughout your life. Um, how and um, who can inspire us are good questions. Um, family and friends are great sources of inspiration, but maybe role models, personal heroes, maybe someone you'll never meet. For me, for those of you who know me, Frida Kahlo is inspiring. Um, I think her life um, is inspiring to remind us to be and celebrate what makes us special. This is a self-portrait collage. It's a narrative. Um, this was inspired by the works of Frida Kahlo and Matisse as well. Music. Music is a great source of inspiration. Listening to music, it increases and um, helps your well-being and positivity, 
but I personally believe that music is an incredibly important component in the creative cycle. Two of my favorite things, cats and Joy Division. This is Fur Division. <laughs> um, this is um, one of my favorite projects to do with artists of all ages. This is music inspired, um, art inspired by music. When a song is playing, lines are drawn on the paper that describe the movement of the song. Um, shapes are then later filled with color, and I think that that's a great way for students to see a song. Reading. Reading, um, it challenges our intellect, it informs us, but it also inspires creativity and encourages imagination, even if you're just reading two lines of poetry and looking at an amazing illustration by Edward Gorey. Oh, this is a masterpiece in miniature out of a huge collection of, of many little masterpieces that are highly detailed. And he has an artist statement that he would like me to read. Um, this is my Batman and Batmobile. I drew it in the Minecraft style, and I love graphic novels. <laughs> um, nature. Nature provides endless inspiration. Um, just being in nature and in natural surroundings, it, it encourages us to be open to experience and it also reminds us to live a more purposeful life. This is from a creative clay class. Um, this is a beautifully formed pinch pot inspired by nature. This artist also has an artist statement that she would like me to read. I made a sunflower, a sunflower pot to remind me of warm summer sunshine. Okay, visually satisfying imagery inspires me. This is by an artist named Emily Blinko. These color-coded collections of everyday objects. Um, I just think this is a great example of how pattern and color and food can inspire. This is a student who's working. She, as well, is inspired by pattern and color and how all those relationships, and she loves to organize. So she's creating a patterned weaving on a clay loom. So why is being inspired so important? Well, being inspired, um, it's important for growth. Inspired goals are of more value once they're realized, which that then results in greater self-esteem and confidence and skills. The student is practicing her skills in fashion drawing, but also showing movement. Continuing then to set those inspired goals creates a cycle of greater goal pursuits. I really love the, um, the quote from Pablo Picasso who said that every child is an artist. Um, the problem is how to remain an artist when he grows up, or she. Um, inspiration is also important because inspiration encourages creativity. Um, inspiration involves being able to see possibilities beyond the existing constraints, and that goes for whether you're working on a large goal or you're working on smaller accomplishments like filling your paper with an imaginary sea creature. So what inspires you? <laughs> Of course. Um, that is a very personal question, what inspires you, that only you can answer. So be willing to feel, be willing to be influenced, be open to experience, and go get inspired. Thank you. Everybody give it up for Akron, Ohio. How about... You know, the creative dynamism, the creative dynamism in this room and in this city is absolutely unparalleled. And I can tell you that this city is a place where the potential energy of imagination translates into the kinetic energy of creation. I'm so happy that we're all here. Um, I, we're just going to, I'm just going to say a couple quick things. Thanks again to our sponsors, the Knight Foundation. I think we're going to give it up for, I think it's time to give it up for the Burton D. Morgan Foundation. What do you guys think about that? I hear there's a place called the University of Southern School of Law that helps out artists and nonprofits. How about that? 
and the C and the C Legal Clinic there, uh, and then also the Akron Accelerator and the Bit Factory. The next thing I want to say is if any, if all the organizers uh, could stand up at this time, because my role in this has been incredibly small. The people that you should be thanking, there's a whole host, they're not just standing up. So, but uh, yeah, let's get up. Let's get the organizers. So. And the very last thing I want to say before we close and drink more beer <laughs> is that uh, Pecha Kucha, Pachacha, Pachacha, PK, whatever, yeah, Pikachu. <laughs> it's all about community. And what I found is that our group of organizers are a community, and I sincerely invite you to be part of that community, even if you have a little.